federal government suspends fuel subsidy removal. And Timi Prey Silva, Duo Diri, and others battle to win the hearts of the people in Bielsa ahead of the governorship elections. This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anna The National Economic Council on Thursday in Abuja said it has agreed that petrol subsidy should not be removed as earlier planned for June 2023. Now, the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Mrs. Zainab Ahmed, disclosed this to the State House correspondents shortly after the valedictory council meeting presided over by Vice President Yemi Oshibajo at the council chambers of the presidential villa in Abuja. Ahmed said the council agreed on the need to have continued discussions on the issue, adding that the federal government, together with states and representatives of the incoming administration, require more preparatory work. Joining us to discuss this and more is Shagun Shopiton, he's a public affairs analyst, and Gospel Obele, who is the chief economist at Streetnomics Limited. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. That's a little bit of a tongue twister. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Good evening, Mary. Thanks for having me as well. Great. Gospel, I'll start with you because you're the numbers guy. Um, uh, President um, Muhammad Buhari was one of those who were the uh, leaders of the um, Occupy Nigeria protest. I'm sure we all remember this. Um, he flanked by several other people who make up his government today. But well, some of the people who protested against the Good Luck administration um, saying that they did not want the removal of fuel subsidy, and they gave reasons. Um, Years down the line, the president is pushing uh, for the removal of fuel subsidy. But then the, the snag is that they've been paying lip service to it. But then removing this, the subsidy in itself seems to be a problem. And now it seems to have been kicked down the line to the next government uh, that might be sworn in um, May 29. What do you make of this? Yeah, thank you. Thank you once again for having me, Mary Ann. Great to be here. Yeah, there are really much more complications to the subsidy conversation, you know, than uh, what we know, you know. First and foremost, the fact that there are very divested interests, you know, for or against the removal of subsidy. Um, again, second, the fact that there is also the drive to be very much politically correct. One of the key elements, you know, or patterns we've seen since the beginning of January 2022, the drive to be more politically correct, especially with the lens from the lens of um, the current, I mean, political administration and handling the band to the back to the neck. So what you have is that the government of Idea would rather the next administration take the baggage of whether to remove or not. Uh, as a, and also that would intensify the expectations going forward. But but then again, let's also take the concern that there is a um, projection by the IMF that in less than two years, it could continue to... Um, you know, um, so the subsidy payments and, ex and obligations that Nigeria may be at the very negative end of the revenue crisis in, in the context of things. We're already in the revenue crisis, but it will technically be very much negative and we'll be using our debt to pay for subsidies. Now, should subsidy be removed or not? I, I think that that's a very big question that the next administration will need to, will need to answer and likelihood that they may want, they may want to remove it. However, I think that the conversation or the argument is much more deeper than the subsidy conversation here. There are root causal elements to the nature of what we are faced with called subsidy. You know, I mean, nature of what we are faced with called subsidy. First off is the fact that you have a very strong demand side economy for fossil fuels. You know, and that's because you do not have power, you know, and secondly, because you don't have the local refineries fixed and working. Now, the lack of those two has led to more Nigerians depending on fossil fuels and as a result of an, an, an increased demand side pressure on what should be imported into the country as fuel or what we term as, you know, um, um, final products from crude oil. And again, that hikes up the amount of money of what it would take, you know, to import this, these elements. Again, um, so giving, giving credence to the argument around subsidy, you need to subsidize this payment so that it's much more cheaper by the time it gets to the end user, you know, in, in context. So if you take out 
the critical elements that bother heavily on demand by fixing those root causal issues, subsidy would not be a conversation on the table to start with. Mm. All right, so the economics of subsidy, everything about the economics of subsidy is really wrong. But then again, it's a distraction within the times you're in, and it's being played along the lines of political interest than what is really key to the average Nigerian. Let's talk about the politics of it, since you're bringing it up. Um, I mean, at first glance, you know, we would look at this subsidy removal as, you know, uh, something that might contradict what the economic plan that the incoming president has. I mean, I'd like to read exactly. He's promising to achieve, um, you know, peace and economic renaissance. Also, um, it could also further, you know, somewhat um, erase any glimmer of hope for citizens in terms of this economic... Because, you see, when you say that you're taking out subsidy, then it means that there are lots of things that we'd have to tighten our belts for. But now you're mm. talking about polit politics and, you know, the willpower to do it and the, f the can being further kicked mm. down the road, which means that he might, we might just keep playing ping pong with it until eight mm. years is over. But if, mm. we were, if it came down to putting their foot down, what, at what cost will we have to, or what will we have to part with to be able to deal with this subsidy removal? It's going to be a very massive cost to the economy. Uh, my thoughts would be a possible removal in phases, you know, of this subsidy. However, that may not necessarily be the case, you know, and then we're back again to square one. Again, removing the subsidy would mean that a lot of political and commercial interests have to be met. You know, deals have to be brokered on the table to ensure that there's a relative or, you know, sensible win on the table, especially for the key stakeholders as it were. But once this subsidy is removed, um, but I feel like Nigerians already have a taste of what a removal will look like. You know, in November, December, there was full scarcity. We were buying a liter as high as 700 um, naira in a dose state. You know, that's technically what the reality is going to look like if you leave it to market forces. You know, again, leaving things to market forces is still a function of how much of balancing you have on both ends. All right, there's a strong, heavy demand side. Now, if you do not have a solid supply base and you leave anything to market forces, Again, just the same way the Nigerian Naira Commission you know, uh, is, really. If you don't have a strong supply base, what happens is that demand will far outweigh supply, and then the prices in the market will keep spiraling in terms of increase over time. And the supplier, we're talking about local refineries or providing alternative energy sources. But that said, that would technically mean that the cost of living would rise. We technically saw that in November, December. And what we saw is just a tip of the iceberg. It's going to get really bad and really worse. And when cost of living rises, cost of food will rise, cost of energy prices will rise, you know, cost of mobility will rise, and cost of farm to market will rise, cost of doing business will rise, and as a result of the increase in cost of doing business, the cost per unit of an item will be pushed to the average consumer. So what you realize is a complex web of cost pressure. And let's not forget, the average Nigerian is already faced with a huge cost per energy, uh, sorry, um, cost pressure as a result of the Russian-Ukraine war and the current inflationary dynamics and interest rates we're dealing with. So, that's going to further worsen things on the economics mm. of how that demand and supply works. Mm. And again, it may not be too healthy in terms of the first thing that the next administration wants to do. I don't know if you get what I'm trying to say. So there's going to be a lot of, that's why I mentioned the fact that the political variable is mm. a major variable in this context. Mm. Again, it's 50-50. The next president-elect may say that he maybe he hits the ground running, like he would always say, I mean, should take out the subsidy or choose to take it out in phases or buy more time before he does that. So it's still a developing story, mm. but this is literally a time bomb waiting to happen. Either way, you want to play the card. Mm. Sounds more like a hot pot with boiling water in it. And um, yeah. you decide whether you want to take it off the fire or you want to use a rag to take it off. But let me go to Shegun. Uh, Shegun, still talking about the politics of it. We've had to deal with realities and the uncovering of the fact that there's a huge degree of oil theft that's happening right under the nose of Mr. President, who supposedly is the um, Petroleum Minister. And of course, with the christening and rechristening of the NNPC, now PLC or Limited, uh, as it's called, um, with all of that, uh, we still are not able to have fuel. We have enough oil, but then it's still sent out to be refined. We still buy it back and we still don't have enough. And there's, we don't have enough policing of this oil, I mean, pipelines. Um, and then, of course, you talked about the politics of it. Um, if we were able to deal with this, plus the fact that we were, devel we're devoting trillions of naira 
to service um, refineries that are not doing anything. And we're paying salaries to people who are working in refineries that are not doing anything for us. Uh, if we were able to deal with these other problems, could you have made one way or the other the removal of this subsidy a bit more easier for us if we were able to plug all these loopholes? Yeah, um, Marianne, look, um, this conversation is not supposed to be as difficult as, uh, as, difficult as it is. Um, I think it is this difficult because, you know, just like um, Gospel said, there are a lot of interests at play. Um, um, so, first of all, you say you want to remove subsidy, and, you know, and I think I, I, I agree with everything that Gospel has said 100%. It will be a catastrophic disaster to take the subsidy away at this time. And I think it's just good that, um, you know, uh, good reason and good sense has finally prevailed. I have said this on all the platforms that I've had the opportunity to speak that they dare not take the subsidies out. You know, it's very simple. So talking about the political uh, uh, angle to things, you have to remember whether people like it or not, and I know that some supporters of the current um, administration and the incoming one do not like to hear this. But this administration is going to suffer legitimacy problems. It's just simple, black and white. You have um, an administration that is coming into power off the back of a 36% yes vote to a 67-63% 60, no. It means that the majority of the electorate said no to this administration, which means the first task they are going to have before any other governance and policy-related issue is to deal with the legitimacy problem and win Nigerians over. How do you win Nigerians over when the first thing that you do is to make their lives doubly or triply difficult? You know, so from the political side, it will be suicide for, you know, um, Atwadiwala Metinobu to go this way. And I think that the removal, the, the extension of the, um, of the timeline for the removal may very well be at his own instance. You know, because, you know, once Buhari has gone back to Daura, you know, he's happy. He told us that he can't wait to go. And then uh, Tinubu is going to be left with, with the very difficult task of managing a policy that the Buhari administration had forced on him. So it's a very good thing that some sort of good sense has prevailed and this has been postponed. But I want to say, you know, coming back to, to the question you asked, look, removing the subsidy will not be a conversation if those basic things that need to happen are done in the first instance. And, you know, the, the, the uh, actually Ebola Ahmed Tinubu has been talked up by his supporters as a legendary, legendary policy uh, formulator, strategy developer, implementer, and all that. I hope they are right, and I hope it's true, because the first thing that I would expect him to do as he's coming on board is to provide for local supply. You cannot remove subsidy if you do not have adequate local supply, local production that takes care of our local demand. If you do not do that, the subsidy question will never go away. Now, consider this, and I would imagine that this is one of the reasons that, you know, this has been postponed. When you take the subsidies out, please, can somebody explain to me who is going to be doing the importation of, of petroleum products? Because NMPC is doing that 100% now. So will NMPC continue to do that, you know, using um, the, the, um, the swap agreement arrangement where they give crude and then we, we collect PMS back and all that, or... Will the oil marketers, the major oil marketers, or, you know, the, the, the independent marketers, will they be allowed? Will they then, you know, have the depot and the infrastructure? How will they source the foreign exchange? Will they source at official rates? Or will they source from the parallel market? Can the official market even meet that demand? Mm. You know, so those questions are questions that the government has not answered adequately, which obviously is why this thing has been postponed. And I would say, and this is just free advice, for whoever is listening in the incoming administration, you do not and you cannot take the subsidies out if you have not dealt with the problem of local refining capacity. This thing is not rocket science. If Tinubu is what people say he is, then this time next year, we should be able to have at least two, either Greenfield or the current government-owned ones, refineries, working. And once you have that in place, then the subsidy question goes away. You know, then it, it's not even, you know, it, it just solves itself. So I, I think that, you know, those fundamentals need to be dealt with before we even come back to the subsidy question at all. Interesting. Um, there, there are a few things that um, I would like to, I mean, the average Nigerian would be curious about. So even if we, we were to agree with, to this subsidy removal and the, 
the incoming government decides they're going to do it at the get-go. There are a few things yeah. that, must, that Nigerians will be seeking to uh, see from this government. And you made mention of the fact that already Nigerians are skeptical about the incoming administration. But then the issue of tra transparency comes to play because, of course, there's not been necessarily transparency when it comes to our oil and gas sector, whether it's upstream or downstream. Um, Nigerians are also going to be looking for trust uh, and Nigerians want to see how funds are, you know, um, utilized. Do you think this will be a major characteristic that this administration that is incoming will be able to exhibit in order to be able to um, get Nigerians onto their side? For, for yes, Marianne, why do you set me up with this type of question? You know, because <laughs> my opinion <laughs> is very, very well known in the public space. Look, um, I always say that you must relate with issues based on evidence, you know, evidence-based analysis, um, evidence-based logical reasoning. And I tell you, Marianne, um, the evidence does not support that assumption. Um, I, I have lived in Lagos for, you know, better part of 35 years. Um, I have been in Lagos through the entirety of this Fourth Republic, um, during, uh, you know, which the, the president-elect was governor for a two-term period. And up until even after he's left. And I tell you that one of the most difficult things that you will get from legal states is transparency, is, you know, costs of governance, is cost of projects executed. So a lot of projects have been executed. Fantastic. And we all know this. We can see it. Um, a lot of revenues have been generated. It's also very good. And it gives one hope that the revenue to GDP problem that the country has can be fixed by the president-elect. However, in the middle of all of that um, financial um, ongoings, inflows and outflows, nobody knows the specifics. We have an idea with regards to the internet generated revenue of Labour State government, but how that money is applied is is, is a secret. And, and you know, and I and I and I say that with all sense of responsibility. So if you go to the website of Labour State government, for example, you would see the published and audited accounts of, of the government. It simply doesn't add up. Mm. I've looked at it. I'm looking for the for the cost of certain projects. I'm looking for the cost of certain um, 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 uh, infrastructure uh, um, uh, 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 efforts and projects on the part of, of, of the Labour State government, and you just don't find it in a manner that agrees with what you believe to be the reality. Because the cost you find there are simply extremely understated. You know, but, so, but, so Shago, but, but Shago, that's not necessarily a Lagos State problem, is it? How, how, yeah, it, 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 how yeah. often has the federal government or even other states across the federation been able to make their budget open and plain and been able to break down how these monies have been spent? How many? Well, well you, you'd be surprised. You know, you'd be surprised that the amount and the volume of the information that is available with regard to the federal government's finances out there. The, the Auditor General of the Federation of Nigeria produces a report, an annual audit report on the federal government finances every year. The content of that report is amazingly damning, you know, um, with regards to how the transactions of the federal government have been conducted, but nothing happens. So it's a bit, the federal government is further down the line on that spectrum, the, on the transparency spectrum. They are, they, are, they are further advanced than legal states currently is. So, you know, will things get better at the federal government level, or will they regress to where legal state government is now? The question remains to be seen. But you have rightly identified this, that if the, the federal government under uh, 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 Ashwagbala Metinubu will win the trust of Nigerians, he has to change his ways in terms of transparency, in terms of even his own uh, body language and the way he, he communicates and the, the mm -hmm. mannerism that he, he effuses when he talks to Nigerians. There is this tendency to be dismissive and to, 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 to um, exude this air of um, um, uh, uh, um, what's it called? Only, only science. You know, I know what is best for all of you. You don't know what you're talking about. Go sit down somewhere. When you see the results, you will applaud me. That body language will not work at the federal level, sir. So you have to change this. People must trust you in order to support your policies okay. so that they don't sabotage you. One of the biggest problems that the Buhari administration faced when they came on board is that they did not have the trust of the people for long enough. The trust that was there, they were wasted very quickly 
And before you knew what was happening, there was a lot of sabotage and, um, uh, you know, negative expressions from the populace. So mm. the, 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 the uh, president, uh, Bola Ahmed, when he gets sworn in, needs to deal with the transparency question. You are very spot on with regards to this. Okay, gospel back to you. Um, Nigerians have been really perturbed by this $800 million um, um, loan from the World Bank that um, they said they're going to use as some sort of palliative to cushion the effect of, you know, the proposed subsidy removal by June. But then trade and labor unions and some in the oil and gas industry have not hidden their disapproval for this. And, and we have a clip here by the TUC, I think, in a kitty state. Let's take a listen and then uh, I'll come back to you. It, what I said is that it is not going to be removed now, which means it will not be removed before the transition is completed. That's what, that's what it means. But then we have two laws that have inadvertently made the provision that we should exit by June. So if the committee's work, which will include the representatives of the incoming administration, determine that the removal can be done by June, then the plan... The work plan is removed. We also have our own position. The minimum wage will never be 30,000 again. The minimum wage will go to nothing less than 100,000. And we're going to tell the federal government that you put it side by side. If they can accommodate it, go and remove. But our minimum wage will not be less than anything, 100,000. That is it. It is there we'll be able to cope with 500 naira per liter or 600 naira per liter, or 800 naira per liter. Another condition we gave was that refineries, at least two out of the four, should be put into not less than 80% use. Because without internal production, the internal refineries of our Crude oil, don't let me deceive you. Nigeria economy will be going down. Gospel, so this is what they're saying. If you're going to remove subsidy, then of course you're going to have to increase our salaries. And this is detail for everybody. Um, COVID came with its own whirlwind that you know made us have to chop off some of our take home pay which did not take a lot of us home anymore and some some companies are still having to deal with that the cost of living is rising high but the pay take home pay is no longer taking people home and so do you agree with the position of the TUC in Equity State one of the things I know and I'm very comfortable or convinced about is that there is a gross undervaluation of many things in Nigeria even the GDP is undervalued inflation is undersized you know, rewards are underpaid or undervalued in many cases. So, top of mind is that subsidy or not, there has to be an overall review of salary structure and reward structure in the country. Now, we, we now contextualize the, the current events that are happening, the cost of the new crisis and all that. Yes, the, the, the arguments by these institutions are actually very much valid. Because right now, it's getting much difficult you know, for the average Nigerian to even... I mean, bread is about 1,500 right now. It used to be about 450 two to three years ago. All right, so how do we go from 450 to 1,500? That's to tell you how really bad things have gone. Not just about Nigeria in context, but actually globally. The UK has hit 10% inflation, about the highest in five decades. You know, So there is a clamor for salary increase globally. There's a clamor for review of revenue structure globally. There's a clamor for, you know, more discounts and more, you know, everything that has to help the average Nigerian or average individual gain some form of relief. So on the grounds of that, yes, they have a very valid proposition. The big ticket argument is, number one, where will those monies come from, you know, in terms of the government paying these guys? Mm. Number two, are we even making enough money or generating a lot of, a lot of um, uh, fraction enough as an economy mm. to be able to meet expectations. So those are very valid. So as much as you look at the demand side, you also want to look at the supply side. Which is why I think that removing the subsidy outrightly upon resumption may not be a very good idea. Yes, it could be removed in phases, but the current impact on the average Nigerian is going to be astronomically high. So yes, it's it's valid, but the questions heavily borders on, on the supply side of that, that equation. Are we really going to be able to pay a hundred thousand for each civil servant 
um, monthly as a minimum wage, which I think again is a possibility to block all the wickedness and you eliminate government waste. That's a possibility. Um, Shogun, let me ask a question. Nigeria is believed to, I have spoken to a lot of scientists and, um, and a lot of people who work in the oil and gas sector, um, some who have even worked in oil companies and retired. And one of the things that I've gotten to realize is that Nigeria has some of the largest, if not one of the largest gas reserves in Africa, but yet it is very underutilized. We're not even tapping it. Don't forget the issue of gas flaring. We would rather take money. Uh, instead of you know stopping the gas flares and using it for other things, we'd rather not. Um, do you see the new, next administration taking advantage of this situation and making more money for us on the side, being that now we're looking for every way to mop up cash? Yes, I, I, I believe that look, one thing you cannot take away from Paul uh, Ahmed uh, is that he's a very brilliant mind. He's got a brilliant mind. He's a blessed man. Um, so if the displays the political will, then absolutely, you know, um, during one of the engagements that he had in the run of the election, he actually addressed this issue, and he addressed it very eloquently. He, he demonstrated a very um, good, deep understanding of the issues in the oil and gas sector. Let's not forget that he was a treasurer at the top most level for an oil and gas company in Nigeria. So he understands the issues. I believe he's going to tackle them. He recognizes and remember his pain for his um, ability to drive revenues up. So he's going to be checking out all of these angles, and I'm sure that um, he will make some moves, uh, some right moves in this regard. And that is where I think the conversation needs to head into uh, towards how do we increase the revenues instead of fixating and being upset about the removal of subsidies. Look, our revenue problem is a tremendous problem. I said it on air before. Nigeria has the lowest revenue to GDP, tax revenue to GDP ratio in the world, except two countries that war and oil countries that do not tax their citizens. We are running at 3.7 percent to, uh, you know, to the GDP. It, it, it's atrocious. Mm. The best countries in the world run. In fact, we have African countries that have 22 uh, percent uh, tax revenue to GDP. So that must be the area of focus uh, for the government in a manner that will not be punitive and that will not further impoverish the Nigerian people. I think this will be an ongoing conversation, guys, and unfortunately we're out of time, but we will revisit this conversation. I think we have to keep sounding like broken records until something is done. Uh, Shagun Shopitan is a public affairs analyst, and Gospel Obele is the chief, chief economist, I beg your pardon, of Streetnomics Limited. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for having this conversation with me. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, up next, we'll be turning our attention to Bielsa State as the governorship elections draw near. All those who are flying the flags of the different political parties are gunning for the votes of the people. Stay with us.